Okay, we might get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, we're going to start by uh, acknowledging that um, we live and work on stolen land. Um, I acknowledge that First Peoples have sovereignty over these lands and continue to shape and protect landscapes and urban environments across the continent. I pay respect to elders past, present and future and thank them for their continued stewardship of culture and country. I acknowledge that I benefit from colonisation every day. As we discuss economic injustice, we have to recognise that across the board, the challenges that we face disproportionately harm Indigenous folks and that many knowledges and solutions exist outside of Western academia. Um, so just to give everyone a heads up, today we're recording this event. Um, so if you've got questions uh, and you'd rather not have your voice recorded, please pop them in the Q&A box, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your Zoom window there. Um, so yeah, questions should all go in that box. If you wanna chat amongst yourselves, there's the chat box as well. Um, if you wanna comment on what anyone's saying. Um, we've got uh, three speakers today. So we have uh, Anne from Modern Money Australia, Jay from the Australian Unemployed Workers Union and uh, Victor from the Centre for Full Employment at the University of Newcastle. Um, my name's Kristen, I'm also from the AUWU. Um, and I'm joining you from Gadigal country. Um, so we've got how to submit a question, how to raise your hand. Uh, there should be a little icon somewhere there, but as I said, pop your questions in the Q&A box. That's the easiest way to get them through. Um, and yeah, we're gonna get started now. So of course this event is about COVID and unemployment and the macro and economic views on that and some of the solutions that we're hoping for. All right, over to you, Anne. Hello, thanks Kristen. Um, before I say a few words about Modern Money Australia, uh, I would also like to acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Kulin Nation and I pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, so I am a member of Modern Money Australia and if you'd like to find out more about the group, you could head to our website, modernmoneyaustralia.org and you can get in touch with us via e email at info at modernmoneyaustralia.org. And we're also on Twitter and Facebook. So we are very happy to be co-hosting today's event. And so for us, that um, puts this event into a series of, event of events that we have held, uh, which are a number of talks all about different aspects of the economy. And you can find recordings of those events on our YouTube channel. Just go there and type in Modern Money Australia and you'll find those recordings. Uh, on our website, you'll find various resources, including links to a podcast that I co-host with Kevin Gaynor. And that podcast is all about the experience and economics of unemployment. So today's talk's very dear to my heart. Uh, the Modern Money Australia group, uh, what we aim to do is to promote a school of macroeconomic thought known as Modern Monetary Theory, or MMT. And if you're new to MMT, you might wonder why a group of citizens <laughs> needs to get active around some obscure school of macroeconomic thought. And just to give you like a taster for why that is, um, if you yourself or um, anyone you know thinks that taxes fund federal government spending, then you might be shocked to learn that you would be sorely mistaken. So what modern monetary theory does is it offers a very different view of how um, modern economies operate as compared to with what the mainstream economists would tell us or, you know, what the received wisdom is. Uh, so one of the things that um, modern monetary theory can tell us um, as based on its understanding of um, how currencies work is that what you can do in an economy is limited by your real resources. So that's all the stuff that you can taste and touch and see. Um, you know, your real resources are the crops that you grow or the minerals in the ground or um, the extent of your workforce, the skills of your workforce, um, 
the state of the healthcare system, the state of your education system. So all of that stuff is your real resources. And so what the economy can do is never limited <laughs> by the financial side or by the dollars. So at a federal government level, it's never about the government uh, trying to run after taxpayers or you know, run begging to rich people to find Australian dollars. And so from that, um, once you understand that the constraints are real, they're not, as they say, fiscal, uh, then you can understand more about what is the capacity of the federal government. Uh, in other words, what kind of policy space does it have? And so, for example, at the moment with the COVID-19 response, um, what we're seeing is the largest spending program that the federal government has undertaken since World War II. And that gives weight to this assertion by modern monetary theory that the Australian government can purchase whatever is for sale in Australian dollars. And of course, that includes all unemployed labor. And I'm sure our guests today are going to elaborate on that point. Um, but what I'll just say is that modern monetary theory also shows us that all of the spending that's happening at the moment is not creating a debt that future generations will have to pay off. But unfortunately, these are the ideas that are in circulation. And so that's why we need groups like Modern Money Australia to, um, to show that uh, how, what the reality is of how the economy is operating. So um, basically I do invite you all to try the MMT lens on for size if you haven't already. Um, Cause I know for myself personally, it helps me to feel less like the world is falling apart, you know, with this COVID-19 and much more like, you know, we have an amazing, like unique <laughs> historical opportunity to reset the economy and, and get it working for everyone. So with that, I might throw back to you, Chris. Kristen. Thanks very much for that intro, Anne, the overview of MMT. Um, we're now going to hear from Jay. He's the policy officer um, at the Australian Unemployed Workers Union, as I said earlier. Um, and Jay is currently working on reviewing all of our existing policy and getting very smart people together um, to build new ones or update them at least. So Jay, let's hear from you. Thanks, Kristen. And thanks, Anne and Victor and Josh for getting this sorted today. Uh, just before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I, I, I meet here with you all today from the uh, uh, Kulin Nation of the Wurundjeri people. Um, <clears throat> and I acknowledge that I benefit from colonization every day and nor should this acknowledgement of country be, you know, just the end to the ongoing post-colonial struggle. So we are, Representatives, the, the AEW are representatives of some of the most vulnerable people in the community, and they are made so by a culture that stigmatizes people for the perceived individual failings rather than the systemic failures of market rationalism. My single mum relied on welfare payments to house and feed her two children whilst they were too young for her to work. Because of this, I was aware from a young age that there are just some things within this life that are not the fault of the individual. Despite our situation, mm. we were comfortable and managed to get by. Not that my mum would let on if we weren't. Uh, it's also, it's almost strange thinking about this now as the unemployment rate is expected to reach 13% before the end of the year, meaning that 2 million people will be unemployed and on benefits. And it's likely that that situation will become even worse after JobKeeper ends, well, is reduced in September. But what is more terrifying is that figure of 2 million people being on an unemployment payment that is below the poverty line, with those payments dropping even further on December 31st. It's what an awful way to end an awful year. So just a bit of a background on the uh, job active system, which uh, people on the job seeker payment are forced to go into. So the job active system uh, prior to COVID-19 was an awful system. People are referred to as participants in this system and uh, were supposed to be assisted by the providers who claim to identify their skill sets, their barriers to work, and would help them develop resumes and connect them to employers in their local labor market through training in how to apply for work. The reality, of course, is the complete opposite. 
The AEW has documented a system where unemployed are treated with derision, lied to and bullied by these so-called providers. If you fail to complete tasks handed down to you or these mutual obligations, as they're known in the system, you would receive a demerit. It's essentially a penalty that is not regulated by social security law, like other aspects of the system. So there is no chance of an independent appeals process. Five of these demerits and you enter the penalty zone. One demerit in the penalty zone is a reduction of 50% to your payment and a second 100% reduction and a third you're cancelled from this system and are unable to re uh, reapply and for four weeks, which you have to do through Services Australia. So then there is a work for the dog program that despite the name, it is not work, it, but is, is classified as a work-like experience. This is a forced labor program that pays the unemployed well below minimum wage to make jewelry or mow lawns or make bus shelters with a group of fellow unemployed people. You may think that what I say here is hyperbolic, but it isn't. Everything I said to you about work for the doll is taken from the job active deed and the job active guidelines. It's also worth noting that providers receive a payment for each individual who enters work for the doll. Today on the front page of the Saturday paper, reporter Rick Morton has exposed that on conservative estimates, these providers are set to net $500 million in additional payments. Some of those advanced administrative administration payments in anticipation of the incoming millions of unemployed people. Let that sink in. While millions of people are forced into poverty by our government, private companies with links to both major parties are reporting large gains of which the taxpayer is paying for. You would think that with the increase in unemployment and a nice pay packet for these providers that there might be some change in the system to cater for the increase. But no, they have retained the same practices and but without the promise of employment. All this while these providers lied about the state of current mutual obligations through the ongoing pandemic and have threatened hundreds of thousands with financial penalties if they do not comply. And the response of the government, nothing. The AUWU, its members and supporters have complained to the Department of Education, Skills and Employment's National Customer Service Line including directly to departmental officials and directly to advisors in the office of Senator Michaelia Cash, the Minister for Employment. Despite these first-hand account, first accounts directly relayed to the supposed, supposed power, nothing is being done and the abuse continues. Because of the lies about mutual obligations still being in force, because of the people being told they have to do work for the dole, a forced labor program in the middle of a pandemic, the AUWU decided that something had to be done, a statement to stand up to the abuse of the vulnerable in the middle of a pandemic. We decided to organize the mutual obligation strike. On day one of the strike, we were accused in the media by Minister Cash that we were encouraging people not to apply for work and that, we would, that what we were doing was bizarre. And even ALP aligned critics of the AUWU questioning what we have to strike against. Well, everything that I have already stated. The mutual obligation strike is to raise awareness of the awful job active program that has forced that has a forced labor component and that people can the people can and they should not engage with their provider. With the majority of mutual obligation requirements being voluntary, because of because as pointed out in the Saturday paper article this morning, these companies make a profit from the unemployed being on their books. Even when some workers transition off job seeker and onto job keeper when their company or their place of employment becomes eligible, these providers earn from that. The strike is about raising awareness of the punitive program that punishes people for situations that are sometimes beyond their control. We have released material for people to use, whether it be guidelines informing them of their rights during the current voluntary stages of mutual obligation or template letters to give to their providers to tell them that they should, that they refuse to engage with them during the voluntary stages of mutual obligations. Something which we could never have done prior to COVID as we would have endangered the unemployed. But now that we can, the unemployed are empowering themselves to stand up to this horrible system. So 
As we, along with our allies and supporters, seek to provide solutions to the punitive job active system, the AUWU will remind everyone every step of the way, welfare is not in employment. A truly supportive welfare program would be a wraparound service that gives universal access to housing, health, education, and a strong livable welfare payment to support all needs. All of this will assist people in building their skills before guaranteeing them access to secure and sustainable employment. And if they fall out of said employment, we must ensure that that safety net is there to support them again and again. So thank you and back to you, Kristen. Thanks, Jay. Um, and we'll be covering at the end, I think, how to get more involved with both MMA and the AUWU, um, if both of those updates sounded interesting to you. Um, so now we're going to hear from Victor. Victor's going to talk to us about some of the strategies um, that he's been working on and some of his expertise around how we might address these problems and challenges that we're facing. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much to the um, preceding speakers. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of both of those groups and I think they're doing terrific work um, for unemployed people and to promote the cause of better public policy in Australia. I'm just going to um, uh, share the screen here. I take it that's hunky dory. Good. Okay. Well, um, yeah. So today uh, I'm talking about <clears throat> how we might be dealing, how we might deal better with the uh, COVID situation we're currently dealing with by utilising the full capacities of the uh, Commonwealth's fiscal powers to address the issue a bit more fulsomely than we are, and to also start thinking about <clears throat> what the implications uh, of this capacity that the Commonwealth has to build a better so society than the one we've got. Anne's already referred to the idea that the, the restraints that we are told exist in terms of um, public funding <clears throat> are mythical. And um, I'm going to touch on some of those today uh, as we go through this. So essentially, um, COVID-19 is both a health crisis and an economic crisis. The health crisis has played up some, has uh, highlighted some real weaknesses in the social system that we have. Um, the virus control measures that they've had to bring in have been, uh, have imposed constraints on social and commercial activity. Um, but they've also shown up things like the inadequacies of our national manufacturing capacity in relation to the production of um, personal protective equipment. There have been fatal outbreaks arising from the insecurity and lack of training of casualised aged care workers, cleaners and security guards. And uh, there's been uh, significant evidence of um, harm done through the isolation and neglect of vulnerable populations, such as people with disability and rising domestic violence. So the social system is not well equipped to deal with something like this uh, as, a, as a crisis. In terms of being an economic crisis, it has some slightly unusual features in that it is affected uh, on both the demand and supply side of the economy. So on the on the demand side, that is the amount of um, um, demand for Australian goods and services, that's been affected by reductions in things like tourism and the international students that aren't coming to the country and also the effect of the global downturn generally. There's also been uh, a fall in income from private sector employment and household expenditure as a consequence of people not being able to um, work and that's showing up in the um, weekly um, payroll jobs index and total wages index data. That green line there is the, this is um, from uh, tax office data, that um, they're able to track um, what's happening with uh, wages 
uh, for companies that use a particular type of reporting mechanism for their taxation. So it's not all employers, but as an indicator of what's happening in the economy, it's a pretty handy thing for us to have at this stage. It works by starting off by, by saying that wherever wages were on the 14th of March, um, they're calling that 100 and everything else is an index from that. At the moment, we're seeing something like a 6% fall in the amount of income being paid in wages. That, that amounts to tens to hundreds of billions of dollars um, not being spent in the economy. And the problem that we're having in terms of an impending recession is that there has been insufficient public expenditure to fill the shortfall in that income. If you look at what the Rudd government did during the global financial crisis to fill the fall in aggregate demand that occurred then, all the, you know, the pink bat schemes and all the extra funding that they pumped out through the social security system, it was sufficient to close the gap to the point where we didn't really experience a recession in this country. Whereas there are still countries around the world that are still climbing out of that recession. So, what, what's, what's going wrong at the moment is that our federal government is not making enough of an effort to fill that aggregate demand gap. And so issues like the $60 billion shortfall in the JobKeeper funding was an early example. I know Bill Mitchell was onto this about a month before uh, it hit the mainstream media. Um, and what it indicates is the government's playing games of saying they're putting X amount of dollars into the economy, but in fact, they're not really putting that money in. And there's questions also surrounding things like the home renovation scheme, that that seems to be not being subscribed to the extent that they were claiming it would be. And as a consequence of insufficient aggregate demand in the economy, there's rising unemployment and underemployment. Uh, now that's on the demand side, but the thing that complicates matters to some extent, uh, and also because the way, the way the private sector operates, it's an amplifier. So if there's a downturn in demand for goods and services, the private sector responds by cutting back on its output and production, and it lays off workers, and those workers don't have wages, so therefore that feeds into the fall in aggregate demand. The, <clears throat> on the supply side, we've, do, we've got this additional problem that the virus control measures are preventing businesses from operating. And so that if we just increased aggregate demand in the economy, um, we could run into bottlenecks and inflation problems. And so, and so it's not just a standard matter of boosting aggregate demand at the moment, we have to have an intervention that also tries to address those supply issues. So any sort of response, because the Commonwealth is the sovereign monopoly issue of the currency, it has got a, an unlimited financial capacity to pay for anything. Uh, what this solution really requires is for the Commonwealth to fill the aggregate demand gap uh, and to also facilitate the opening of supply chains. So it would entail an expansion of the public sector. That is what we're looking at here. So in addition to maintaining income support payments for workers until they can attend their workplaces, there should be an enhanced COVID response program. So an expansion of all things that we're currently doing like testing and tracing, there needs to be perhaps some public sector industrial cleaning task forces public marshals to manage um, infection control in public spaces so that there's a, um, uh, a lot more management and control over how people are conducting themselves. Some quality public quarantine facilities rather than this hodgepodge of, of uh, hotels that obviously has been a, a, a cause of the problems down in Melbourne and elsewhere. We should be manufacturing um, our personal safety equipment. We could have teams of people working to uh, enable and facilitate um, IT in schools and other sorts of settings. 
and to have also an expanded domestic delivery system put in place that enables us to limit movement. So if we had have hit that uh, the virus with a massive expansion of what we're currently doing um, by through basically providing armies of equipped personnel to enable businesses to reopen supply, we'd then be in a position where we can boost aggregate demand and not run into inflationary bottlenecks. So the, the, the act of actually investing in that, that workforce to do that work would actually be in itself a boost to aggregate demand would, would fuel uh, an increase in jobs in the private sector. So as the supply capacity is progressively restored, um, we're then in a position to then really work on the unemployment issue. And the first step we need to do is to restore the public sector as a source of permanent, well-paid, secure employment. And, and that would entail reversing decades of cuts, of downsizing, of outsourcing that have undermined our capability to manage the sort of problems that we're dealing with. Now, if you think about things like the management of pandemics and bushfires, for instance, one of the problems we had, we encounter with um, bushfires is actually um, um, made worse by the heavy casualization of our labor market. So one of the problems with recruit, so bushfire fighting requires volunteer firefighters and the volunteer fire fighting services have encountered a lot of difficulty over the past decade or so in attracting volunteers. And the problem largely stems from the fact that in the past, when we had um, a lot of people employed in the public service, there was no difficulty for people to, if they got a call to say, can you come and fight this fire? They could dust down tools and run out the door, totally secure that their job would be there when they got back. Whereas when you've got a casualised labour force where, where people are being, you know, popped into shifts here and there, if you were to turn around to an employer and say, I'm going to rush off and fight this bushfire now, there's a very good chance you wouldn't get another shift. Or if it becomes, if it's firefighter fighting season and they know that you're a volunteer firefighter, they just won't schedule you to have a shift. So the, the demise of secure permanent employment actually is undermining our capacity to meet these really serious challenges that are obviously being made worse through climate change and all that. Um, the other things that we need to do, I know it's been pushed off the agenda a bit because of everything else we're dealing with, but, but it was only a couple of years ago when, the, uh, when we were told that there was only 12 years to take action on climate change or we're all going to hell in a handbasket. So there needs to be a massive... Um, reorganisation of our economy and our production systems. And that's going to require a massive public sector in, involvement in doing that. Um, whoops. Um, we've got persistent chronic problems with um, um, poverty and uh, unemployment in this country. Um, We've got a last census, we had 116,000 people who are homeless and a massive requirement for an increase in public housing. We've got issues of substance abuse where people are seeking treatment, can't get into treatment. Massive problem with domestic violence, growing suicide rates. All of this stuff is all due to the fact that the public sector has not been there to address these issues. Everything's being done through these outsourced, casualised, marketised, contracted services that have patently failed in, in addressing these sorts of issues. Lack of investment. We've got the crisis in our human services. So there's been um, multiple royal commissions into aged care over the past few decades. Um, the, the current one's been reopened to deal with the fact that the aged care system has totally failed to protect our elders who have died in, in atrocious numbers as a result of the uh, inability to manage infection control uh, in these settings. We've got similar problems with um, disability support and the abuse that's gone on there. 
uh, and there's been an absence of adequate family support and the state systems are all straining under the, the challenges that they're facing. All of these services need to be massively expanded. Uh, and we can do the same with our education and training, our public transport, and in a whole stack of areas that never get much attention, but they've been the subject of massive cuts over the years that have left us a less capable uh, nation in terms of dealing with the sort of crises that we have to deal with. Now, if we were to invest in that and produce permanent full-time work in these areas, um, uh, all of that expenditure would also drive um, demand for private sector goods and services. And as a consequence, we would bring unemployment right down. Okay, so how low can unemployment go without triggering inflation? According to modern monetary theory, if you use the right policy tool, we can have full employment, that is 1%, 2% unemployment and maintain price stability. I'll come back to that. Um, the, the classic uh, argument has been that we need to keep a pool of people unemployed to control inflation. Modern monetary theory completely rejects that. The argument is that keeping over half a million people unemployed, which has been you know, just the average, we've been well in excess of that over the last few years, and keeping another million or so underemployed is actually a very poor way to maintain a spare labour supply. Because when people are a long time without work, their skills atrophy, skill formation doesn't occur, they're not training or learning, um, practising their skills through their work. And <clears throat> Um, even when there's uh, a pickup in the economy, um, employers don't look to the unemployed for their recruitment. They look for workers who are already employed. So this spare labour supply um, is actually being bypassed by employers. And in the process of poaching workers from each other, it bids up the wages of those workers while the unemployed are being ignored. And the consequence is we have these, when we have recessions and things like that, what happens is that there's um, uh, the contraction of the economy creates pool of unemployment as the, as the uh, economy picks up again, um, uh, the government has to sort of shut down economic growth because the wage inflation that's being caused by this poaching going on. So classic example. So um, it, it just to depict that, in, in using uh, unemployment and underemployment as your spare labour supply. What happens is if there's a recession, um, that, that pool of unutilised labour rapidly expands. When there's a bit of an up a return to um, economic growth, employers find, a, find it hard to find the sort of workers that, with the levels of productivity that they want. And as a consequence, there are skill shortages, there are inflationary bottlenecks, and the government chokes off growth uh, and the, the return to full employment or return to reasonably full employment is extremely protracted. So the argument that we make is that after boosting the public sector to boost private sector demand, so you really you can substantially bring down unemployment to very close to full employment, the Centre for Employment and Equity and the modern monetary theory people say there is an economic argument to say you could get away with really running in unemployment down to very low levels, provided you adopt a model like the job guarantee labour market stabilisation system that they talk about. And the gist of that is that instead of having a pool of unemployment, you maintain a pool of jobs that are paid at the federal minimum or uh, wage that anyone can access. So it will provide a balance of 35 hours of employment per week. So if you've got it, if you work for 10 hours somewhere else, you can pick up 25 hours uh, in this system. The jobs would be designed to be of benefit to the community and the environment. They'd be integrated with a national public employment service. There would be a work tested interim income support payment while all this gets organised. Uh, the jobs would be designed 
in such a way that they would inculcate skills in the people doing them that are in demand in the local economy. Uh, you, would work, you could work with people with special needs, people who are recovering from injuries, people with disabilities. Jobs could be designed around their abilities so that they could have some social inclusion. Um, and a higher standard of living that's, than is offered by pensions and allowances. The system would be integrated with universities and TAFE to provide experiential learning to graduates and apprentices, people like that. And it could nurture and spawn all sorts of cooperative uh, enterprises. In the process of using this as your spare labour supply, workers' skills are preserved and extended. They would maintain a dignified standard of living and that there would be no inflationary bidding up of wages needed to attract the workers from the job guarantee pool. Um, at the moment, the federal minimum award wage would equate to $694.30 for a 35 hour week. So substantially above what uh, New Start was. Uh, and this would be, it's a job. It's not like work for the doll. It is just a job. It's the job the same as everybody else has a job. The only thing that is particular to this particular job is that the wage does, is fixed so it doesn't rise and that's so it has the counter inflationary impact that we're seeking but this could be used as a very creative um, vehicle for all sorts of useful um, uh, public um, development and um, public service development um, the people working in this pool would be actively being uh, match to vacancies in the open labour market by the Public Employment Service. There would be a wide choice of community enhancing and environmental work to do. This would be a tool for community developers to be designing jobs for people who have been isolated and left out of the uh, labour force for decades. The jobs could be designed around their needs. Um, <clears throat> And there could be a very creative conceptualising of what would constitute work. So, you know, I, I could envisage, all, I'm an ex-musician myself, I could envisage all sorts of things that perhaps don't normally get considered to be work, but I can see all sorts of artistic and creative and expressive things that could be of benefit to the community in all sorts of ways. Um, and the, the system would have to include a substantial amount of local community and local government oversight because a lot of the jobs that we'd be trying to um, uh, develop would be things that are happening at the very micro scale of society, things that the public sector hasn't traditionally um, been uh, aware of or engaged in and things that the private sector aren't generally interested in because they can't make a buck out of it. So then that takes us to the question of can we afford it? And modern monetary theory definitely says yes we can as the sovereign monopoly issue of its own currency with a floating exchange rate the commonwealth government can finance any expenditure that it desires uh, people will always ask you know does that does that uh, amount of spending would it produce inflation and the answer to that again is no provided that there are spare resources things that the are available that no one else wants to buy by definition, for example, unemployed labour, um, and that the economy has the capacity to supply the goods and services that will be increasingly demanded by the people that are now, they're not on new start allowance, they're now pulling the minimum wage, that would add to demand in the economy as long as there's a capacity for the economy to supply those goods and services, there won't be inflation. Now, it's interesting, I was reading, I don't know if Anne noticed this, uh, Ross Gittins was in the age today, um, making a number of concessions on behalf of mainstream economics about um, the argument that modern monetary theory has been making over the years. Uh, There's a growing debate among economists between uh, MMT and conventional economists. The defenders of the conventional wisdom have had to concede a lot of ground, whereas a decade, a decade ago, MMT was likely dis dismissed as a crackpot idea as this radical idea is gaining more attention, its opponents have to admit <clears throat> it would be perfectly possible to do. And that is a pretty substantial um, concession. Um, they, they just think it would be a really bad thing to do. And I'm gonna spend the latter part of this talk explaining why they think it's a bad thing. 
Um, he says that um, sensible economists always knew that it was never true that creating money uh, always leads to inflation. It does so only when the demand for real resources uh, exceeds the supply of real resources, which has been the MMT position all along. What he does say, though, is that once demand was growing faster than the supply for real resources, so, OK, he's saying that you could, the pub, you could spend into the economy and you would stimulate economic activity and you could lower unemployment. Uh, what he's saying is that what's worrying about this is that if that politicians couldn't be trusted to use this power only up to the point where it would, you know, might start causing inflation. Um, he's saying that, you know, the politicians couldn't be trusted to stop uh, when they reach that point. And the point really has been that the politicians themselves have been at the forefront of saying that they did not have the money to address social needs. So uh, I've got a clip. I, 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 I wasn't going to run it because I didn't have the time. But there's a great um, moment on Q&A last year when uh, Erica Betts is, gives a very, uh, you know, sensitive explanation as to why uh, they couldn't increase New Start by $70 or whatever it was. And he was just saying that, you know, we, we just wouldn't have the money and we'd be left in, you know, paying off this massive debt or whatever um, thereafter. Um, COVID hits, instantly they can double New Start allowance. Money's no, money's no problem. So the real fear in all of this that they don't actually acknowledge that's really sitting at the bottom of this, which is why there is this resistance to the use of the public sector as a, a source of driving down unemployment, is that the removal of unemployment as a method of socioeconomic control over working people uh, is their biggest fear. Keeping people in their place with unemployment has been the principal tool that working people have been um, you know, subjected to controls um, going back uh, hundreds of years. So I just thought, for some people, this is a, an odd thing to be arguing, but uh, it's also interesting, and I teach into social policy at the university. Uh, it's really interesting for some people to discover that Australia actually once did operate at full employment um, for 32 years. The um, uh, So this is... Uh, this is um, the Australia's unemployment rate over 150 years. Uh, two very prominent spikes are the 1890s depression, which Australians don't know much about, but it was uh, a time of great industrial warfare um, that uh, destroyed the early trade union movement. And out of the ashes of that, when they, they decided that they needed to um, uh, uh, get some parliamentary representation to defend themselves, um, that, that spawned the Australian Labor Party. It came out of that depression. Most of us know something about the 1930s depression. Uh, and then there were these two um, uh, recessions of the 80s and 90s, the one that the Fraser government created and the one the Hawke government created. Uh, but an interesting period that we hear little about is that for um, 32 years, the unemployment rate didn't actually go over 2%. And that wasn't by accident. That was because it was government policy to use aggregate demand management to keep unemployment under 2%. It was a time uh, when the right to work was championed as a cause of the labour movement. Uh, this was from uh, the inclusion of Article 23 in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, is largely the consequence of the advocacy of the Australian delegation, because it was the, in Australia that full employment was established and the principle of the right to work was established during the Second World War. So the right to work's got a long tradition. The basic idea of it is that there is a proposition that says that when the private sector has employed all the people it needs, then governments have an obligation to provide um, uh, work for those who, who need it. Um, it also has a very long history of fervent employer opposition, which I can, I'll just, I won't go into any details, but um, there was, um, there was uh, 6,000 workers were slaughtered in Paris in 1848 
fighting for the retention of the of uh, a full employment system that was put in place for a few months. Um, there were riots, uh, 20,000 unemployed rioted in Trafalgar Square in 1886, and the um, demanding uh, something be done about the unemployment. And when the parliamentarians uh, debated it in, uh, in, in Parliament in the subsequent weeks, one after the other got up and said, and so there was a proposition was put up that we've got this, uh, a stack of public works projects that we've had blueprinted for years. Now would be the time to do it. This was proposed in the Parliament. And uh, Speaker after speaker got up and said, "We, you know, yes, labour's cheap at the moment. Uh, yes, these public works would be really handy to to um, do, but we do not want to do them because we don't want to imply that workers have a right to work." Um, in 1908, there was a right to work bill put up uh, by James Keir Hardy in in Britain, and in 1919. Uh, in Queensland, there was a, a very substantial full employment bill put uh, put up by the um, uh, the Premier of Queensland at the time, a fellow called Ted Theodore. Theodore's, Theodore's proposition was um, the unemployed workers bill was um, uh, large scale public sector job creation. Uh, it received massive employer opposition. So he was basically saying, for the returned soldiers coming back after the First World War that had walked into 10% unemployment. He was saying that the government of Queensland is going to fund job creation and to employ um, the people of Queensland. Uh, and it met with massive uh, employer opposition. It was called the Loafers Paradise Bill. Uh, and the argument of the employers um, was they never actually explained how um, giving people work to do uh, would uh, make them loafers. What the employers were actually arguing for was that there should be an unemployment insurance system put in place instead, um, based on one that Winston Churchill had introduced prior to the war. And no one in this debate ever explained how offering people work would turn them into loafers, but offering them uh, sit-down money, unemployment insurance, wouldn't. Um, to stop Theodore doing this, they sent a delegation to the employers, sent a delegation to London, and they organised a financial blockade of Queensland to prevent um, Theodore implementing this plan. Uh, and the, it didn't really get lifted until he left Queensland politics. He transferred over later on, he got into um, uh, federal politics. He became the treasurer of Australia at the start of the 1930s depression in the Scullin government. Um, he proposed during the depression um, an expansion of the use of the, the currency. He tried to establish a reserve bank to manage monetary policy. He tried to introduce fiat currency uh, during this is the time of the gold standard. Um, all, of this, all of these efforts were blocked by the banks were blocked by the Conservatives in the Senate. And it was for these reasons that Australia had a particularly terrible um, uh, depression. Um, the, the Joe Lyons was feeding information to the bankers overseas. Uh, he was uh, feeding them, he was like a mole within the uh, cabinet. Uh, and um, basically they were able to outmaneuver the Scullin government. But in that government, there were John Curtin and Ben Chifley who had been watching Theodore closely. And so when they managed to 10 years later come to power during the Second World War um, and the country had to mobilize for to fight the war, they created this thing, the Allied Works Council that built all this public works all around the country um, that rapidly brought the country to full employment. Unemployment hit something like 2% at the end of 1942. And um, they put, um, Theodore was actually put in charge of that operation, massive public works project. In 1942, they ran a constitutional convention where they said that they're going to go for full employment after the war. And here's uh, Evett made this speech saying that with the, with the lesson that it took a war to teach us, because of course, massive public expending 
of public expenditure to mobilise for the Second World War. Um, uh, unemployment comes down to, to 1% or 2%. The public turn around and say, well, hang on a minute. How come for the last 10 years we went through that depression, you telling us that we didn't have the money to do this? Now, as soon as you there's another war for us to fight, instantly you've got money coming out your ears. Where's how's this come about? So so Evert makes the point. He says that with the lesson that it took a war to teach us, we can no longer assert that the problem of unemployment is insoluble, that men are out of work only because they are unfit for work or unwilling to work. I mean, does this sound familiar, anyone? That financial policy prevents their employment, that their task, that the task of maintaining full employment is not a responsibility of the national government. That was the Attorney General of Australia at that convention. Curtin said that, made a pledge that there was not going to be a repetition after the Second World War of what happened after the First World War. And they just made it very clear there should be a national public works policy directed to improving the welfare of the community, time to correct deficiencies in private spending. When private enterprise fails to employ all available workers, the government must step in and ensure their employment. And that was what they did in the 1943 election campaign. Curtin just made it clear that in time of war, money was no bar to meet the demand for work for all. His government had given its pledge that in peace, all the money needed would be found to provide work for all who wanted it. This led to the 1945 white paper on full employment that uh, entailed uh, massive public housing uh, uh, building um, uh, program. They, they went for, they tried to build 50,000 uh, homes in the first couple of years after the war. They ran into some uh, uh, material shortages that slowed them down a bit, but there was a massive expansion of public housing after the war. And within four, four years of the war ending, just to give you a sense of just how, um, just how uh, uh, habituated people became to full employment. This was the Argus, this is a Melbourne newspaper, of the day um, and some stories about uh, a plane crash. There's on, on page one, page two, there some local um, social activities and, and happening in Melbourne, a bit of international news. We're in the Cold War. There's a, an election looming. It's 1949. Uh, Labor's um, going to um, um, create a communist state if you re-elect them in 1949. Um, and then on page six, just there in the middle of the page, you barely notice it, here's this announcement. On Wednesday, there were 2,700 people unemployed in Australia. This is at a time when the population of Australia was about eight and a half million. So the equivalent today would be about 10,000 people unemployed nationally. And uh, that's, how much, uh, that's how much notice it was given. You know, it was so taken for granted. Now, um, from the outset, business was opposed to full employment. And this is what I'm trying to get at here. So when the, the issue of full employment was being debated in, in Britain, as it was in other countries, the Times newspaper ran uh, an editorial where they're explaining why uh, full employment's not such a good idea. It says that unemployment is not a mere accidental blemish in a private enterprise e economy. On the contrary, it's part of the essential mechanism of the system and has a definite function to fulfil. The first function of unemployment, which has always existed in open or disguised form, is that it maintains the authority of master over man. The master has normally been in a position to say, if you do not want the job, there are plenty of others who do. When the man can say, if you do not want to employ me, there are plenty of others who will, the situation is radically altered. And we see quotes, I've got a heap of these, I'm not going to show you them all. This was one from uh, uh, when John Curtin died, there was a, uh, a, a, a um, uh, an election to fill his um, seat and um, people were asking him in this uh, in Western Australia, um, what are they going to do now that the soldiers have had all this experience, uh, they're not going to come back, want to come back and work as farmhands on our farms. So Menzies quite coolly, and this is um, Bob Menzies, uh, Mr Menzies quite coolly gave the answer at the Fremantle by-election. Uh, 
by stating that a pool of unemployed was necessary to discipline the workers. And these, these things are quite common. So this is from 1949, the Sydney Morning Herald. The plain truth is that in a labour market which favours the seller of services, workers have become less inclined to exert themselves. They have lost their fear of unemployment and generally speaking, no other adequate stimulus to steady conscientious effort has replaced that economic spur. Um, the chairman of the junior chamber of, uh, of the Institute of Public Affairs, Mr. Grimwade, um, said that unemployment was a promoter of energetic endeavor and respect for authority, whether benign or malign. Mr. Grimwade emphasized that in the past, minds have become warped by this fear of unemployment and heaven forbid that I or anyone else should call for its reintroduction. But um, all throughout that period, um, the unions and the Labor Party in opposition kept warning that if you don't uh, watch the Conservatives, they will pull the pin on full employment. And these stories kept um, emerging all through the 50s and into the 60s. And each time they came out, the government was forced to um, turn around and um, make pledges to the public to say they'd never, you know, countenance such a thing. In, um, by 1970, though, the corporations around the world were up in arms about um, the fact that uh, workers had so much bargaining power in countries where there was these very low levels of unemployment. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the OECD um, put out a... Um, a publication called Inflation, the Present Problem. This was something, a unit that the Nixon administration uh, established. Um, and in that uh, document, they, they make the point that workers' bargaining power under full employment was squeezing profits. Uh, and they, uh, in this publication, they made this point, which I think is very interesting, that people's reaction to going bankrupt or being thrown out of a job may have been different in the 1930s when it could be thought that this was the result of a natural disaster. But today, a serious recession would be clearly recognised to be the result of a deliberate policy being followed by the government. So back in the days of full employment, people were so habituated, they understood how the full employment was brought about. They understood that it was due through um, the uh, expansion of the public sector and public sector employer, uh, employment. Uh, and um, um, it was impossible for governments to abandon it without getting blamed for it and having this incredible electoral backlash. In that publication, they speculated that if there was some sort of uh, shock to the world economy that the governments could all point to, they could cut their public expenditure under that smokescreen. So if there was something like, you know, uh, like the OPEC oil shock that came along a few years later, you could cut public expenditure and that could be used uh, as, um, as uh, your excuse for doing it. You could deflect the blame. Um, in uh, the year after that publication came out, the um, chairman of BHP went on a series of uh, speaking engagements, this is Sir Colin Syme, uh, where he called upon the McMahon government to increase unemployment. So that's the problem with full employment. Um, during the 70s, the Treasury officials tried to um, um, uh, induce recessions behind the backs of both Whitlam and McMahon. They, uh, uh, they managed to succeed with Gough Whitlam. Um, the OPEC oil shock came along and injected this massive inflation throughout the world. So in 1974, behind the Whitlam government's back, the Treasury officials caused a contraction. Uh, and because of the time lags, it took until uh, mid-1975 for unemployment to rise to 5%. Um, the Whitlam government internally were having this uh, debate and uh, reading, the, um, reading the arguments to and fro are really interesting, but essentially some of them were arguing that we could temporarily let the unemployment sit there uh, and use that to try and bring down the inflation. Other members of the Whitlam government said it was a total... Uh, act of treachery against working people, and we can't do that. Uh, but the Hayden budget um, infamously preserved unemployment, didn't take action to bring it down. Uh, and unfortunately for the Whitlam government, they thought they had another two years in office before they'd have to deal with the electorate. Uh, things happened 
uh, faster than they expected with the sacking of the, the government in November 75. Uh, the Fraser government got elected on the backlash, due to the backlash that was visited upon the Whitlam government for the loss of full employment. And then the Fraser government um, pushed unemployment up to 10% over the next seven years. With Bill Hayden then took over the leadership of the Labor Party and uh, the Labor Party was broke. By 1977, they'd fought four federal elections in five years, they were bankrupt. Their opponents had been receiving millions of dollars from foreign sources, from largely from Americans. Uh, and the cost of uh, elections was inflating with each election. Labor had no way of competing with the Liberals. And so what, what Hayden did uh, was to um, change the strategy so that Labor would compete with the Liberals for corporate donations. And that business model has been in place uh, ever since. Uh, and as a consequence, the ALP abandoned its commitment to full employment. They both, uh, since that time, have used unemployment as a way of keeping down, um, keeping workers uh, and their bargaining power um, suppressed. So we see what's happened since 1978. We see the two recessions, the 1980s recession, where John Howard was Fraser's um, treasurer um, and uh, unemployment got up to 10%. Um, the 1990s recession, the one that uh, Paul Keating said we had to have, but um, and there's been this uh, what appears to have been an improvement in the unemployment rate since that time. But this is an unemployment rate where to be employed, uh, you only have to be uh, employed for one hour in a week. So what happened was when the labour market casualised, and this is the underemployment rate, um, there was a massive um, uh, rise in the level of unemployment relative to the level of, um, uh, of, of underemployment relative to the level of unemployment. So you can see that the gap between the unemployed and the underemployed, who are people who need more hours of work, uh, it rose, doubled, during the recession we had to have. And that was primarily because just prior to inducing that recession, the, um, the Labor Party in 1989 uh, and the ACTU agreed to um, structural efficiency principles in the, um, the setting of, a, in the uh, award restructuring process. And one of those principles was to remove the restriction of on, on, uh, restrictions to casual employment, that up until that point in time, the longest that anyone could be employed as a casual was three months. Casual work was used as a, as a way, as a probationary period to see whether someone fitted into a job. Once you're employed for three months, you had to be made permanent. In 1989, that was removed as an award structuring principle. And so when they put a million people out of work, um, it left people clawing for competing for jobs and uh, employers were able to offer them casual positions and the economy rapidly went from one of the least casualised labour markets in the OECD to one of the most in the space of just three or four years. And we see that that's reflected in the doubling of that gap. As the decade wore on, we're into the period of the Rudd government, the GFC, there was a bit of a rise in unemployment, but we can see that the gap has extended between those two and the gap between the unemployment rate and the underemployment rate has considered, continued to widen. And what that's telling us is that the level of labour underutilisation that workers are having to bear, the reason why they've got such poor bargaining power uh, is because that although the unemployment rate might be low, the actual level of labour underutilisation has been very high. In fact, uh, it's higher than it was uh, at the start of, at the time of the 1980s recession. What's that done to the bargaining power of, of uh, working people? Well, this is the um, trade union uh, membership. Uh, that's the period of full employment where we can see that it's been, uh, that it was at its most consistent. Uh, from 1980, when the effects of the abandonment of full employment kick in, we see there's been a steady decline in trade union membership. 
and largely because with the insecurity that people have in workplaces now, workers were less prepared to identify themselves as being in the union or to take any industrial action. We can see another interesting uh, demonstration of the impact of that. This is the this is the um, the amount of income that has been um, paid in Australia or earned in Australia from the 1950s up until the present day. And we can see that there's been a, there's a little bit of a blip at the time of the 1980s recession, a little bit of a blip at the time of the 1990s recession. But essentially, it's just been a steady, steady growth in national income throughout that period. Um, but the, if we look at the share of that income that is going to the top 1% of income earners in Australia, we can see that from the, um, the 1910s, there was a steady improvement, particularly during the full employment period, uh, in terms of the a decline in the inequality in income distribution in the country where that top 1% was actually uh, getting less and less of a share. From 1980 onwards, where the workers have been disempowered by the restoration of labour underutilisation, it's been rising uh, ever since. So between, between, during the full employment period, the gap between rich and poor narrowed, there was a high degree of home ownership, high union membership, rising living standards. And since the 1970s, with the abandonment of full employment, there's been a marked shift in Australian society, deepening precariousness, the gap between rich and poor widening, significant poverty, homelessness and social neglect uh, and declining union membership. And probably worst of all is that the public has been conditioned to just accept high levels of labour underutilisation as if it were beyond the capacity of government to prevent. And that's the most shocking thing about this from my point of view. So just in conclusion, we can say that neoliberal assertions that governments cannot afford to employ the unemployed or to provide higher standards of public provision, like raising new start allowance from absolute uh, destitution levels, they're all based on fa false claims about the financial capacity of governments like Australia's. The public are increasingly aware of that fraud and the current crisis is demonstrating that to people if they've got their eyes open. And public commentary is increasingly acknowledging the merits of the argument. And I think that working people need political and industrial representatives to advocate for the elimination of unemployment and for the restoration of the public sector as a source of permanent secure employment and high standards of public provision, and thereby reinstate and restore and give commitment to Article 23 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and that is that everyone has the right to work. Thanks very much. Thank you, Victor. That was excellent. And uh, I think everyone was enjoying that history lesson a great deal. Um, so we've got quite a few questions and we don't have a lot of time. Um, I really do ask uh, everyone to keep responses very brief. I think most of these at the moment are specifically about job guarantee. Um, so the first question we have, uh, Victor, is a job guarantee just one among a number of policies needed to return to full employment? And uh, the questioner, Kevin, um, felt that that's what you were getting at. So maybe it's a yes, no answer. Yeah. yeah, certainly. It's just one of a number of policies. And the main thing would be just to expand the, um, the public sector. Just, yeah. not, just re restock the public sector, give it back its purpose. Yeah. And we have a question from uh, Vincent. And the question is that some of the uh, professions that you listed are professions that have a higher award wage than the minimum wage. And so um, would under a JG, would those workers be paid the minimum rate under the current award? Um, or would they be paid uh, the minimum wage at its most minimal level? Um, and then a follow-up, um, you know, if workers in that industry want a future pay rise, would they still need to leave the job guarantee so that it would be good for inflation? Um, I think. I guess that doesn't mean good for inflation. I think that means to manage inflation. Yeah. Um, I think we need to just be, uh, just as a basis of a bit of clarification. I think people, um, people don't understand the 
the role of the job guarantee, okay? It's actually only intended to be a very marginal and peripheral pool. We want to run the economy at close to full employment. It's just to try and alleviate some of those inflation pressures and to also give as many people as possible the option of actually having the ability to have a paid job. The job guarantee is just for that marginal situation. So most of the things that I've been talking about in terms of what we need to expand, I'm not talking about them being job guarantee jobs. I'm talking about the actual public sector, the public service being reinstated as having its role in the economy. But in terms of the job guarantee, if you've got people who the private sector or the public sector don't have a demand for their labour, then yeah, they would work in that in that sector uh, in the job guarantee system for the fixed minimum wage, and that is a necessary thing if we want to sustainably run at full employment. Now, I still think that that is you know that's not an ideal situation. I think it'd be great if we could just make sure that everyone had you know whackingly well paid jobs entirely. But the problem with that is that it's not sustainable and that economically it falls apart. The way we actually go about doing it, that's, that's up for a lot of discussion. That's up for a lot of people to, to have their say in that. All that Coffee's ever done is said, here is, here is an economic mechanism that we can use to maintain full employment. And it's, we've been quite uh, open about in papers that we've written uh, inviting people to come in and engage with us about how it might be operationalised and set up institutionally. But I, I, I think that sometimes people think that it's it's about, you know, just about replacing the entire public sector with job guarantee. That is not the concept at all. Thank you, Victor. Um, so the next question is about uh, constitutionality. So in 1945, um, it was argued that the government was not able to put in place the laws it needed to to ensure full employment. So is that, well, A, was that the case, I suppose, and B, is it the case now? Yeah, they had a, they had a referendum um, in 1944 that, that they failed to get uh, that was seeking an extension uh, during the Second World War. The reason, the reason this thing was able to be pulled off by the Labor government was that during wartime, the Commonwealth has massive uh, freedom in terms of its economic controls. And so they set up a lot of things like establishing social security and things like that during the war. There was another, so in 1944, they sought to get an extension of those powers for, I think it was you know six years after the war, to bed down the full employment so it wouldn't have, they could manage the economy properly. And um, Menzies, Robert Menzies having, um, you know, uh, lost, having been dumped as the leader of the Conservatives just in the early days of the war, he managed to re resuscitate his career by leading the campaign to block uh, the granting of those powers in 1944. But in 1945, the government came out with their white paper and they managed to bed this thing down. Um, in 1946, there was another referendum that established the Commonwealth's right to establish things like sickness benefits and all sorts of other benefits and allowances. That was a successful, um, uh, that was a successful referendum um, that um, uh, enabled a lot of the mechanism to be put into place. But uh, yeah, they managed to pull it off without the need to get those constitutional powers. It probably would have worked more effectively had they had them, but they still managed to pull it off. Okay, thanks, Victor. Um, we've got a question about developing countries. And I guess the question is based around the idea that uh, many poorer countries don't actually have, uh, or they have a lot of debt in foreign denominated currencies. Um, so how would they approach or can they actually implement something like a job guarantee? Yeah, well, it does depend on countries having, um, I mean, uh, it does, the, the financing of it does depend on countries having sovereignty in their own currency. And it's always a bad idea if you do have you carry heavy debts that are denominated in for, in in foreign currencies, because that really does uh, limit uh, the room that you have to manoeuvre. Um, so it'd probably be a bit of a case by case um, um, situation. But there have been a number of developing countries that have adopted 
uh, a sort of semi-job guarantee models. Uh, this has been um, embraced in uh, um, uh, a South American country, I've forgotten which one exactly, uh, and in India, uh, they have um, um, uh, schemes where um, uh, head of households can uh, access uh, job guarantee type uh, work. Now, they're all limited type of schemes, but um, in terms of in terms of how modern monetary theory would be used to um, determine whether they could afford it or whatever, um, that really depends on which country you're talking about and the nature of its monetary system. Now, I, I, I need to also just, because I didn't really say much about myself, I'm not an economist. I'm actually a labour market political sociologist that, that did his PhD at the Macroeconomics Research Centre that Bill Mitchell runs. Bill Mitchell was my um, supervisor. So I've got a pretty good working knowledge of modern monetary theory, but um, I think some things like how developing countries might um, use this sort of stuff um, would probably be best referred to someone like Bill Mitchell. Okay, thank you. We've got quite a few questions coming in. Um, I'm going to put the next one up and then I'll have a quick assessment and maybe we'll have to take a few at a time. Um, so we've got a question about uh, overemployment and as in people who might be overemployed. Are you aware of whether there's been studies about this um, and you know how that affects or interacts with um, underemployment or unemployment? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, they're both, it, to some extent, it's a phenomenon that comes from the disempowerment of working people. If people are not in a position to um, um, say, I'm only prepared to work 35 hours a week, if they're, in, if they're in jobs where they have to overwork in order to hang on to the position, um, then that, that's going to, it's the same basic problem that workers have been disempowered and don't have a bargaining, uh, don't have a strong bargaining position. And as a consequence, um, yeah, that, that phenomenon, overwork and all sorts of, you know, dangerous work and things like that, that workers might normally be, uh, if they had felt that confident and had the power to do it, uh, they would, you know, they'd take industrial action, they'd have unions that would protect them from it, da-da-da-da-da. Um, but um, that's why I, I strongly believe in the re-establishment of full employment because it, it, it has the effect of empowering working people and so that they can then have more civilised working arrangements. Cool. And Anne and Jay, did you have anything you wanted to add at this stage? Not good? Okay. Um, so I'm just going to uh, sort of lump a couple of questions together that maybe I'm, maybe it's a stretch, but we've got a question about um, whether you think anyone who's currently in politics understands um, the history that you've just shared with us and what you're talking about in terms of MMT and job guarantee. And related to that is uh, a question about whether you think this is a deliberate strategy to disempower workers of the current, I guess the status quo is a deliberate strategy. Well, to answer that last question um, first, yes, that's what my PhD was about. It was establishing the point that um, labour underutilisation is preserved as a method of social domination. It is a technique for managing populations. It's gone on for 800 years. And the, the evidence for that, they used to be, it was quite openly discussed um, prior to workers getting the vote. Once workers had the vote, politicians became very uh, coy about acknowledging that, that point. And um, that's really what sits at the heart of the problem that we have with the government at the moment, that they, they would probably love to hit the COVID virus with everything but the kitchen sink to get rid of it. Massive mobilisation to deal with the problem. But they're fearful that if they show demonstrations like that, the public will be saying to them, OK, well, let's just keep going with what you're doing and let's get rid of unemployment. They have to be able to, whatever they're doing at the moment, they have to then be able to put the toothpaste back into the toothpaste tube when all this blows over because they want to get back to having, be able to say, oh, we can't afford to, you know, we, we can't do anything about unemployment. So um, in terms of the, so the, the first, the second part of the question, I can, I can say hand over heart that I sincerely believe that it is totally 
uh, intentional. In terms of who understands this stuff, I have no doubt that people working in the Treasury fully understand this stuff. I have got no doubt whatsoever that they that nothing in modern monetary theory probably bamboozles them that much. I mean, yes, they have groupthink. What they have a they have an ideological position where they 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 feel that it's their role to keep working people in their place. That's what the game. That's what this game is. Um, they would have a better, much better understanding that that is the strategic um, warfare that's going on than. The average worker does. The average worker is fairly oblivious to this. So I'd say, yeah, I'd say the officials in the Treasury would know what they were doing. Uh, the Greens, there are plenty of Greens politicians that seem to be embracing of a lot of this stuff. They don't necessarily fully embrace modern monetary theory. I don't think they feel confident about advocating for it. Um, but I think that's increasingly shifting. And I think the the, in terms of the history of unemployment in Australia, I'm sure people like um, uh, John Faulkner and uh, and people like that in the Labor Party would be well across all of that stuff. They know it well because you've got to understand when you talk about um, you know when the Labor Party bangs on about the light on the hill and they have this reverential sort of harking back to um, Ben Chifley and John Curtin. Um, those, those phrases like light on the hill came from speeches where they were talking about um, the need to establish full employment and maintain full employment. The 1949 election was fought on uh, totally on the accusation Labor had that if you vote for the Liberals, they will abandon full employment. And the Liberals had to go to that election swearing on a stack of Bibles, hand over heart, that they would maintain full employment, they would keep unemployment at 2% and um, they would use public public sector job creation to do it if they had to. Um, so I, I, this isn't that mysterious to a lot of people, um, but the average members of the public don't seem to be very aware of it. Certainly my students at the uni where I teach, um, uh, whenever I mention this stuff, they've never heard of it. And I think that's probably not uncommon. Thank you. I'm going to call a close to questions. We've been uh, running quite a long time now, so um, we'll try and take the ones that are there. Um, I think a link to Victor's PhD should be quite simple and we can send that out um, okay. well, after the... There's a few issues with that, so I won't, I won't make any promises about that at the moment. Yeah. Okay, yeah. no problem. Um, maybe people can Google it and find it and access it themselves in oh, whatever look, way they... It's, yeah, it's not that available at the moment. Um, it, there's... Yeah. Um, it's going to be a forthcoming book. That's the issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've got a question about whether a job guarantee would create a conflict with businesses that have a similar um, role in terms of the types of work that they do. Um, and there's kind of a couple of questions here in one. So apart from restocking the public service, um, would there be other employers and who would they be? Um, and also, where would we go to get this job, job guarantee program and, and how would we receive the salary? Uh, well, the, the job guarantee would be run by the, the a National Public Employment Service. So I would replace the, the job active system and job network. There won't be a marketised system. It would be a restoration of something like uh, one of the versions of the Commonwealth Employment Service. And you'd, you'd rock in there, you get registered, you're unemployed, I've lost my job. And they'd say, great, here's a range of jobs going at the moment. You can have as a fill-in if you want. And you'd say, oh, no, thanks. I'm going to take a few weeks off and say, fine. Or you might say, yeah, I need the money. Okay, you can start tomorrow. And the jobs would be in your local community. And uh, this, you know, this, the, the, the institutional arrangements for this, they, they, they're not necessarily set in concrete that, that I, I would really welcome other people's opinions about ways of doing this. I've written a number of things. There's a paper that you could look up if you want to get some uh, details about it called The Job Guarantee in Practice that I was the principal author on uh, <clears throat> that you'll find on the Coffee website. But if you just Google The Job Guarantee in Practice, you'll get the paper. Uh, and um, uh, the... Um, the it would be, the job guarantee would be its own public sector organisation. You wouldn't have job guarantee with private sector employers. And on, to, on the question of how would you, you know, would there be a problem with the private sector jobs being displaced by the job guarantee jobs? That is absolutely an issue, a design issue. 
that's addressed in that paper I talked about. Um, the idea, uh, the idea that we have, because the thing is, the system has to be have additionality. You can't have a, a system that regulates unemployment if uh, the, the the Commonwealth is funding uh, job guarantee positions that are then displacing other employment. So it, it has to really be designed so it prevents the displacement of other jobs or else it's not it's not having its a buffering um, you know, effect. Uh, so the ways, the ways that that would be done would include things like giving the local council veto over any, any job guarantee jobs that are designed in an area and for the local councils to have to run um, uh, as, a, as a session in council, they would be open to have people get up in council meetings and say, I am objecting to that particular job guarantee, proposed job guarantee job, because it's going to affect my business one way or the other. And the local council can say, okay, we're going to send it back to the, we'll send it back to the Commonwealth, back to the drawing board, and they'll have to come up with something better. So that the local council will have a veto over that. And that will be one of the reasons why it has that veto. Thank you. Um, we do have a question uh, that's related to history um, and uh, talking about things beyond the harvester judgment. And I feel like maybe that's a bit of a big question for us to go into. And we have covered some of the content that would be related to it. So I'm going to ask Kate uh, if you could follow up with Victor over email um, and we'll make that possible with the follow up information that we send out. Um, and that means we've got one more question. Um, and the question is, if we have a job guarantee for people who remain unemployed, so for people who maybe don't want to take up a job guarantee job um, and do something else instead or look to re-enter the private sector, um, you know, how would they continue to receive a payment like JobSeeker um, and what would happen for people who can't work? For example, some people who might be disabled um, and other types of folks who are out of the workforce for some particular reason. Yeah, well, of course, you know, if, if, if uh, not everybody, you know, can work, um, that there'd be people with, um, you know, disabilities and injuries and things like that. There are people with psych issues, psychological issues, um, where uh, a case could be made that they should be on, um, you know, disability support pension or something like that. Um, the actual, you know, when it gets down to tin tax, I think it would depend to some extent about what the cultural norm was at the time this thing happened. If, if for instance, if it was uh, considered okay for people, you know, plenty of people advance the idea of the universal basic income. Now, if, you know, if that became an established sort of norm, well, that would just sit there alongside the job guarantee, you know. Um, my personal view, and I know there are advocates for the job guarantee that said there should be no income support. Um, I'm, I've been a specialist employment counsellor. I was I worked in Melbourne for uh, about 15 years uh, as a specialist working with people with um, disability and long-term unemployed ex-offenders, people like that. And I'm very familiar with the complexities that are involved in people settling into different types of work. Um, it's been, it was, a, it was a, something that I uh, trained, uh, had significant training in and years and years of practice doing it. And so I'm very aware of the fact that it would be very difficult to accommodate everybody that wanted to work, even if you had something like a job guarantee. So then you need to have some form of income support arrangement in place for them. So there's issues, there's things that we've always had or had for it since the 70s, like special benefit, uh, and other sorts of allowances and things. But, you know, it's the, from the standpoint of, um, you know, the advocates of the job guarantee, it doesn't really, you know, it's not absolutely central to its design that it be done in this particular way. We've suggested a few different models um, to give people the, the chance of getting their head around it and get the sort of a sense because, I mean, I've told this story a few times, but when I turned up at the Centre for Employment and Equity, um, it was just that they, they were economists and they would just be explaining this in mathematical formulas. And, you know, and I was saying to them, well, how do you expect anyone to understand this? You know, I don't, I don't bloody get these formula things. I can, I can understand it when you explain it to me. Um, people need to see a working model of it, some, some sort of 
you know, structure to explain how all the ifs and buts would work. So we've done a bit of that. We've, we've I've produced a few papers myself. There's a few coffee publications that I am the lead writer on um, to try and sketch that out for people. But in both of the public, in, in both the publications I'm thinking of, there's a very clear um, uh, invitation for people to weigh in on this and to give us some their point of view on how it should be how it should be run. But my personal view is that I'm very, very aware of the complexity and diversity of the people that are unemployed and um, that uh, it's not a one size fits all situation is going to work. You could accommodate a lot of the population with some fairly standardised offerings, but then and then you'd also have to have the capacity to do a lot of tailoring around people's needs and create bespoke jobs for them. Uh, and then there would also be another part of the population that really this isn't going to work for them. Uh, but I think, you know, my, in my experience, that would be a fairly small number of people, and I don't think it would have much adverse impact on the system as it operated. Sorry, I lost my unmute. Um, so that's our last question. I'm just going to ask Anne and Jay for final thoughts. So I'll go to Anne to you first. Yeah, well, thank you, Victor, for another wonderful presentation. I just love the history and I can't wait for the book. <laughs> and thanks, Jaden, too, for your perspective on what's going on at the uh, AEW at the moment. And I have to say that I personally am a big fan of the job guarantee. Um, however, it might look in the details, um, the idea of a universal job offer is just a fundamental need <laughs> at the moment and always has been. So, um, yeah, basically just look out for MMT, as Victor was saying. It's starting to pop up in the media now. So that's what we're all trying to do, you know, get get the word out there in the public discourse just so that, um, you know, if the general public is aware of all this, then the politicians can't hide behind any kind of charade of ignorance. <laughs> you know, it's going to be part of everyone's conversation. So, And thank you too, Kristen, for, for um, helping us get through today. No problem at all. Um, so, Jay, did you want to add anything? Yeah, um, thank you for that um, very insightful lecture there, Victor. And thank you, Anne, as well, for your input as well about MMT. Um, yeah, so the unemployment, or well, the Australian Unemployment Union, uh, we are beginning to slowly get started on our own perspective of the uh, of our idea of a jobs guarantee, because um, obviously there are some people uh, out there who are worried that it might just be a bit of an expansion of the current work for the Dole program, which, you know, we're obviously quite we're against it. Um, so we'd want to make sure that, you know, any any policies that were implemented ensured and guaranteed, you know, the best uh, outcomes for, you know, vulnerable people uh, in the community. So, um, yeah, once again, thanks for having us here today. Um, and thanks to Kristen for mediating us all, organising it. I would say I didn't do my best work today, but I think everyone's enjoyed the event. Um, as I mentioned before, there'll be an email coming out afterwards that will have a bit more information and ways to find out more. Um, we do encourage everyone who's interested in the work that um, MMA and AUWU are doing to um, join up. So if you would like to join the Unemployed Workers Union, you can go to auwu.org.au. It's a very hard acronym to say. Um, and uh, you can also search Modern Money Australia to find MMA. Um, we're all on social media, of course, so please um, follow us and share our uh, posts and contribute your own ideas. Um, I think Jay mentioned the mutual obligation strike earlier. So if you are uh, currently receiving a payment from Centrelink and you have mutual obligations, um, you can find information about the strike uh, on our social media again. Um, and we do encourage you to look that up because right now you don't have to be engaging with these job agencies. And we know that for most people, it is a really harmful process. So we want to try and give people um, the information they need to assert their rights to resist engaging until it's absolutely necessary to receive a payment. Um, so we've also got the 3CR radio show. Uh, and do you want to remind us when that's on? Yeah, so it's on the second and fourth Fridays of the month. 
at 5.30 to 6.30. Great. And that's also available as a podcast. So if you go to the 3CR website, um, you can find the sewer show there and have a listen. Um, I think that's it. Is there anything more that any of you want to add? I just wanted to say thank you very much for the organisers, for Kristen, to Josh and to Jaden and Anne for the great work that you're doing. It's a very important cause and it's great that you're doing so effective in it as well. So thank you all very much. Great. Thanks a lot, everyone who joined us and for all of your excellent questions. I um, hope you have a lovely afternoon and lots of food for thought. And yeah, hopefully you've got lots more reading to follow up with.